follow up is there's different ways to gain qualitative data. And so mm-hmm. in, in doing that, you're talking about having maybe sit down interviews. I mean, I know that there's a few different ways that you can do this through, through a plugins on, on a website. Do you find, you know, at some point you, you want people to tell you the honest truth about, about something, about some kind of experience. And, you know, there, and, and I know there's even varying degrees of detail because sometimes people don't want to. I, I recall a lot of times when they do this in the physical world where, where you'll have done something and then you pass by a kiosk that has a series of smiley faces that go from frowning to kind of neutral and then and then happy and you know I mm-hmm. could touch whatever I want and it's really I have no idea what they're going to do with that I mean it's really just a single input so so at one point is, is that useful because that's that's I guess a, a qualitative thing I'm I'm saying here was the quality this was good or bad but there's no detail there how do you see in terms of the detail-oriented qualitative feedback being beneficial. I mean, are those smiley faces beneficial? Can we do things with that? Or or in your opinion, no, if we really want to gain good insight, we should take it to the level like what you were talking about at Mojo, where you're talking to people directly. Or no, some middle ground is good, a form where where we have something through a plugin that asks people a couple questions in a survey, and then that that's good enough. I mean, how do you know how much granularity you need in your qualitative data? Okay, so the, the important thing to keep in mind there is that concept that you yourself are using there, Wes, which is the granul- granularity and how much you need. And I, what I can tell you is that whenever you're going to use data, you have different types of, 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 of questions that you want to answer. And so one thing with decision making specifically is that in the past, and they, we're getting better and better at that right now, is that people have... Uh, it made a lot of decisions based on their gut feeling and so on. And people are, are starting to understand how to use data and so on. Uh, but then in some cases, people go the, uh, the, to the other extreme. And it's, I always need data to be able to make a decision. And that leads you to um, analysis paralysis and so on. When it's actually the case that if you have a low stakes type of decision, then going with your gut feeling might actually be the optimum way of going. Because it's not worth going so deep into these other things. And in other cases, when it's, when it's high stakes, then you need to collect your data. And the reason I, I mentioned that right now is because, well, if you want to know when to use more qualitative data and less qualitative data, because obviously meeting people one-on-one is much more expensive in terms of resources and time and everything compared to doing a focus group, for example, versus just collecting data through this uh, manu- kind of with buttons in, in, a, in a mall or something, or just collecting quantitative data in some other way. So you have this whole spectrum of different tools. And that's why I would say it's, it depends on how high, uh, the stakes of the decision, if it's high stakes, low stakes, that uh, it depends on that first, uh, how important it is. But then on the other hand, you can't forget about doing these things periodically. I would say you can definitely get away with a focus group or surveys every now and then. But you should never leave the one-on-one interviews out completely. If, 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 if we remember Peter Drucker's quote on the purpose of the business being creating a customer, we need to understand what is valuable to a customer. And, and so we need to be able to have one-on-one conversations knowing that these people might not be representative of the whole population, but still these conversations give us really valuable insights that we can work on And usually the way it goes is I have a one-on-one conversation with someone and they might say, I think this is very painful and I think this would be very useful. And then I take all of those different ideas and we can create a survey. And then we send them out to more people, let's say 100 or 500 people, to see if those opinions of that one person are representative of the whole group. And so you can ask uh, multiple people and they'll say, no, I, I don't agree with that pain. This is not painful for me. Or I really think that I need this and so on. And so you can build upon the different sources of data to get a more complete picture. And that would be a bit, a bit the way to go. Okay, perfect. So I, I, I like the idea that that one-on-one talks because you're, you're just going to get more honesty there than you will everywhere else. Mm-hmm. So I like the idea that having that one-on-one is almost a necessary ingredient in terms of the qualitative side of things. I think that that's super fascinating. Um, you, that, you also mentioned just, uh, sorry for interrupting you there, the, no, no problem, honesty, no the, on, the honesty part, uh, Wes, it's often not a good idea to tell people 
that you're the person working on the product because then people <laughs> tend not to be honest. So it's, it's a good idea to go out there. And if you're trying to talk to someone one-on-one -on -one, and maybe say, I'm researching for this company or I'm researching for this product and I'm going to tell the product people what you think and so on. So you can be completely honest with me, but maybe not let them know straight out that you are the, the, the person in charge of that product <laughs> because people tend to be nice to you. People That's hate hurting your feelings it, it's interesting how people have empathy it's like if you go to them you know you, you have to be at least once removed from from being the owner of the thing because everyone knows what it's like i mean we talk a lot about people becoming customers and really feeling attached to things and they when they recommend things it's because it's it's their word as you said i mean it, it's mm -hmm. a, it's almost like an extension of themselves this product or this brand or something because they use it whether it's you know clothes for their identity or some kind of app they use and what have you so the recommendation comes at comes at a risk really but mm -hmm. then they're willing to do it so in this case when you're talking about having a sense of closeness to something that's not you and we're talking about products people instantly empathize with that because they because we all do it all the time and so they're not willing to give you that that direct kind of feedback that you honestly need to hear i mean you know they, they call it tough love you know but, mm -hmm. but the person doesn't know you there's not a lot exactly. of love to give so so they they would rather defer to politeness that's really funny so for those of you that that are listening that's a great insight is if you want to get good product feedback don't let your product Product owners or product managers do it. Let let someone else give it, or at least tell them to to fib and put on put on their surveyor cap. You know, just just pretend to be someone conducting.